Hi everybody, welcome back. Here we have a Techniques model SL1300 turntable that I need to get some work done on. It generally works okay, but it does have a couple of issues. The first one is that the stylus, when I got this thing, I got it used and uh, the stylus is very badly damaged. It needs replaced. The cartridge, it's has some flaking and pitting on the on the little gold plating on it. It's an Empire cartridge, it's a decent one, but I think it's going to be easier just to put another cartridge on it and I have one that we're going to replace, so we're going to go over that. But the first thing we have to do is troubleshoot a mechanical problem with this. I'll show you what it is here. All right, I have you set up so that you can see, hopefully see the strobe, and I hope that you can see it on the camera. I don't know what the camera is going to do with this, but I have the cue lever up, and when I move this over to turn it on, we're set to 45 RPM, and the 45 RPM on the strobe is this smaller dashed line, the second one up. So you have 33 and 45. These two are for a 60 hertz system. And then you have 33 and 45 for a 50 hertz system over in Europe. So you can see very clearly that the 45 is holding very well. The, if the strobe is working properly, these little dots here shouldn't look like they're moving. You see how this one above it is moving around, how they're all moving? This one is, is steady. That means it's locked in at exactly 45 RPM. And I can rotate this pitch control and you can see how it starts to move. And if we move it back, we can get it to stop. It's very good. And that's it. Now this is not a quartz locked turntable. It just uses a basic electronic circuit, uh, uses a differential circuit with uh, pulses <laughs> to set the, set the speed on it. So it is susceptible to some, if anything, changes. Now the problem is when we switch to 33 RPM, now you see this one will move and this one down here should, should stop. And you see how it's kind of zipping back and forth a little bit? And I can adjust this and you can see what it does. No matter what I do, I just barely touch it. See how it goes back and forth? And if I wiggle this, you could see that it goes all over the place. It's because the potentiometer here is dirty and needs clean. So that's pretty easy. It's going to be the same as cleaning a volume potentiometer. So that's what we're going to have to do to fix it. Now these two knobs are just the fine adjustment down here. But if you lift the platter mat up, and you look down inside, you can see right there are a couple of potentiometers that you can adjust with a screwdriver down through here. And those are the coarse adjustments. And those are what brings the range of these pots where the idea is you want to get these at about the center of their travel and then use these to get it as close to being perfect as possible. And that gives you the most adjustment. You have to understand on these non-quartz locked ones, even though they have a lot of torque, this is a direct drive. It does not have a belt in it. This, the, the platter actually is the rotor of the motor. It's a DC motor. So anyway, that's where we are with this. And we just essentially have to flip this thing over and clean the potentiometer in there. All the other pots are clean and they work fine. It's just this one here is a little bit noisy. So let's get it apart and take a look. Now the first thing you want to do is remove the dust cover and that's just as simple as loosening these four screws and then the dust cover just has slotted, just slots that it slides up off. I normally, a lot, of, I've seen people take this and flip it upside down on and use the dust cover as a stand and on some of the lighter lower end turntables you can get away with that. The plinth on these is very heavy. This thing probably weighs upwards of 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. And therefore, 
you really don't want to put that kind of weight on that. I've seen stress fractures on the dust cover right here where these screw holes are just from the weight sitting on there. I've also seen the corners of the dust cover crack because of the weight. So usually I like to put it up on blocks if we can. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the head shell and take that out because we don't, if something comes loose, we don't want that getting banged around. And because there's nothing holding this platter on other than good old fashioned gravity, we're going to remove the platter. Now because this is a direct drive turntable, you never ever want to plug in or turn on the turntable when the platter is removed. I'll show you why here in a second. So you can see this is a very heavy platter. It's very thick aluminum. And you can see the magnet. This is actually half of the motor. The motor is actually integrated into the platter. And then here's the other stator. So this would be the rotor. This would be the stator. And these coils here have to have a magnet around them or they it could damage the little driver transit the little driver circuitry the transistors uh, the servo that drives this so you don't want to apply power to these coils okay All right we have it flipped around on its top and we have it blocked underneath you can use custom cut pieces of wood. Um, I like these little plastic <laughs> containers that I have here. They just kind of fit under there around the knobs and they don't damage or interfere with anything. You can see these feet right here are rather worn and that's pretty common with these turntables. These, these higher quality turntables again have a very heavy plinth and or base as you want to call it. And because they have such a heavy base on them, these rubber feet will wear down. They'll just squish in and they need to be replaced. So I'll have to see if I can find replacement ones of these online somewhere. I'm pretty sure they make them for Techniques. Techniques is a pretty common uh, model or manufacturer of turntables. All right, I have the screws out already. We'll pull this up. There shouldn't be anything holding it. Okay. And right here are the two potentiometers that we want to clean. We really don't have to do much else on it. I'm not going to recap this. I, this is a later model. It's from probably eh, late 80s, early 90s, something like that. Uh, I'd have to look at the date on it. But I think these capacitors are fine. The, the machine is working perfectly, so we'll check it out. Uh, but I doubt that we're going to have to do anything. These are very high quality Japanese capacitors. Anyway, let's clean this. All right, I've removed the knobs and the little felt pads. Make sure you don't lose them. And there should be just this one screw. Should let us get this thing out of here. Be careful because they're driving it right into the plastic, so you don't want to knacker that out there. All right, and then there's this little pin that this is sitting on and you can see they put a little bit of glue on it. So we're going to have to make sure we release that without breaking that little pin. Somewhere I have a little tool that might help with that. Let's see. And there we are. It is out. So the next thing I want to do is remove these little potentiometers from the bracket and we'll do one at a time. I'll do one on camera with you and then I'll do the other one off camera. We're going to do both of them all apart even though one of them's working okay. Now you could just take some deoxit and spray down in there. But with these I like to have, I don't like them to be very loose. When you spray deoxit in there it removes that that uh, grease layer in there and then these things get real floppy and loose and that's not really good for this particular application because this is kind of a precision thing and that glue got on this pot as well so we gotta pry that out all 
right. There we go. Okay. So now we're going to open this up. Let's see if I can find my little pliers here that I use. I like these pliers because they have nice serrations on them for grabbing these little tabs. You can kind of pop, pop it open without, and kind of supporting the back of it without it bending too hard. You can also use a little screwdriver. Just remember, you can't do this very many times. So when you're going to clean this this way, do it the right way so that you don't have to do it for 20 more years. And then that way you don't have to worry about these little tabs breaking off. And then very carefully, we're going to remove this. And you got that glue again. And I bang the camera. <laughs> OK. And there you go. And what we're going to do now is we're going to clean this. And you can see if, if you, I don't, yeah, I think you can. There's pretty good lighting here. If you take a look, you can see the little tracks that these little wipers are making on that carbon. And we want to clean that. And then we want to just put a little bit of that uh, grease on there, that insulating, or the uh, deoxid fader grease. So let's uh, clean it first, and then we'll put that stuff on second. All right, now that we've protected all the stuff below it, and this stuff, you can feel that grease in there, and, we, and that's supposed to be in there. When we wash this with this spray, it's going to take that off, and that's not what we want. We want that to be there. So the first thing we'll do is we'll give it a little cleaning, like so. And we'll work it back and forth. We have to be careful now because the end stop is not in this pot, so you don't want to go crazy moving this around and damage the wiper. You have to be very careful. Okay, now it's all cleaned off. And we're just going to take a little bit of this and very carefully put a little tiny bit in there and then work it down in very carefully. That's all you need. See that little tiny drop there? And then we're going to work that in very carefully. Okay, this is a lint-free makeup brush. And you can buy these online. They're very, very inexpensive. Uh, you can get them on eBay or whatever. And you're just going to take this. Not, not going to touch anything in the uh, wiper itself. You don't want to touch the wiper. Just kind of get it around the track a little bit. Just like so. You don't need a whole ton. You just need that little drop spread around there. And this thing will do its thing, spreading it around. And that gives it that, you know, that damp, damped feel. And that will protect that from wearing the track down. And then the other thing we're going to do is we're going to put a little bit of lubricant down in here to keep this, uh, to keep that happy so it doesn't get all gunked up. And just a little drop in there and let it work itself down. All right, much better. And then I'll put a little bit around this fiber board to let it soak in. And this is deoxid as well. And that keeps the fiber board, that'll soak into that fiber board and that'll keep it from uh, drying out and cracking. Now we're ready to just put the cover back on. Okay, just like so. And then we're going to bend those tabs back over. And we're going to try to do it around the camera. And the phone's going to ring. 
Okay, hopefully I have everything in shot here. Let's put this on here and see if it tracks smoothly. And you can see, nice and smooth. So there's zero. And then if I go this way, And the idea is, if there was a bad spot on this potentiometer, you would see that needle jiggle back and forth. It wouldn't move smoothly. So this is good. And that's what you want. You want it to be very smooth. If it's not, then it, that's going to affect the, the tracking very, very badly. <laughs> now the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clean that other pot in the same manner and it'll last an extremely long time with all this fixed up this way. And then what I'm going to also do is go in here where the motor is and I'm just going to reflow these. They look very good but I'm going to reflow them because this is a stress point there and those solder joints there can get loose and crack. So we're just going to reflow them while we're in there. Alright, let's get that done off camera and then I'll be right back. Okay, and there we go. And in case you're wondering, uh, I showed this on another video, but this is the grease that I'm using. And you probably do not have to use this. I'm sure there's other types of silicon grease that are much less expensive and easier to get. I know other parts of the world, this can be extremely expensive and hard to find. So I think there are other alternatives that are a lot less expensive. And then I'm using the actual, just the regular deoxit fader 100 for uh, the fiberboard and so forth. But anyway, it's all together. I reflowed this. I also took the ESR meter and just checked the capacitors very quickly. They're all in perfect condition. Actually, they're reading <laughs> almost like brand new, so I don't think we're going to have any problems with those. I'm going to put it back together and make sure everything else is good in here and then... Uh, put it all back together. And before we put the platter back on, just I just take a little syringe with some really fine machine oil and just put a drop in there. And uh, that takes care of that. You just need a couple drops and work that in. It's always good to do while you have this apart and then just kind of leave it like that. It'll last a very long time like that. Okay, let's put the pan, the platter back on. If I can see what I'm doing here. And let's see if we corrected the problem. Always remove this, and I always lift this, just in case. <laughs> you never know what the me mechanism, this is an automatic turntable, so the arm could take off on you. Okay. So let's turn this on and let's move this. We are on 33 RPMs and let's see if this, and we may have to go into the course adjustment, I don't know, but it doesn't look like it. Look at that. It doesn't jump around anymore. I don't know if we can zoom you in better. You can see, there it is. And when we wiggle it around, it doesn't jump anymore. That's what it should do. So there you go. So this is fixed, so let's go now and let's mount the new cartridge. All right, we're gonna do this in two steps. Step number one, we're going to mount the cartridge to the head shell and I'm probably going to replace the head shell with the because this one's a little bit getting a little bit cruddy. I'm going to use this one. It's a little bit nicer. So we're going to put a new head shell and a new cartridge and I'm going to use a Audio Technica M95 VM95 E and E means that this one has an elliptical bonded stylus on it and maybe another video we'll get into different types of stylus there are there's a whole range of this audio technica vm95 cartridge available and they're really very good price 
they start I don't know somewhere around the fifty to sixty dollar range and that would be for a conical type stylus and then you kind of get up go up the line the elliptical is a better stylus a little better quality and we can get more into tracking and all that but you the the difference in price that they use they all use the same cartridge itself the only difference in price in the whole VM95 series is the stylus and you can get these all the way up to a $600 <laughs> cartridge and really the cartridge is very similar if not identical the main difference is this green part that you're looking at that has the stylus on it now this is a good all-around cartridge it's not considered a super duper high-end audio file but this will get you in to actually some decent listening if you want to listen to vinyl with a little more seriousness than just what you buy in the store you know that's available today off the shelf this will give you a pretty nice idea of how good vinyl can sound now again cartridges and stylus you can get these things can be up into the many thousands of dollars but really unless you're a very critical listener and if you have the rest of the gear and the listening room and even the ear to <laughs> to use all that it's not worth it something like this for the beginner this is a really good quality so we're going to mount it up when you open this up you'll see a few things here you'll see that it comes with some mounting screws and different cartridges have a little bit different mounting styles but this is a pretty common one so we'll this is a good one to learn on and when we remove this from here you can see that you have this little plastic stylus protector and what I like to do is before we mess with this I remove the stylus from the cartridge to remove this particular one some of them like this one they're a, they're a slide out so you could see they slide out like that these types are a little different they have a kind of a v-mount and you lift up on the corner and they pop right out like that and that's all there is to it and you can see how it kind of just plugs in and you can see that little v those two little pole pieces those are your little moving magnets so we're going to slide this over here very carefully of course and we're just going to keep this out of the way for right now okay now to mount this you can see there's some instructions and it tells you that the stylus on this will last about 300 hours of continuous play and that's a good amount believe it or not that's a long time and a replacement elliptical stylus for an ATVM 95 SE or 95E is not very expensive we could look them up but uh, relative to what some others cost it's not that bad and it's just a matter of popping a new one on like I showed you there here's the instructions and they show you how to mount it on there but we're going to talk about some terminology here when we do this first when you're replacing a head shell this this is called the head shell this is the part that holds the cartridge anytime you're going to replace the original OEM one you want to make sure that you get one that has the same proportions and what I mean by that is if you look the way these are lined up the distance from these screw holes to this shank back here to the to this lip right here on the edge is very critical because what that's going to do is that's going to affect something called overhang and that's a very important measurement that we're going to make when we're adjusting this in the in the end so if you're going to replace the head shell make sure you get the correct one and uh, like I said this one is getting a little bit corroded around the edge it's getting a little bit tight I could probably polish it and clean it and I could probably replace these wires they're pretty well tarnished but I'm just going to replace the head shell it's easier it's all pre-wired it has nice new wires with heat shrink on them and everything and they're gold plated 
and I think they'll this will work just fine. And again, these head shells aren't super expensive either. You can buy them online. I'd have to look it up to see, but these are probably only in the $20 range, I would say. I don't know. But again, you can get head shells that are thousands of dollars too. Turntables, the sky is the limit. Whatever you want to spend, there, there's somebody that'll take your money for it. When you open the fastener package, you'll see that there are two sets of screws and two little plastic washers. Now, the reason there are two sets of screws is there's a longer set and a shorter set, and it really depends on the type of head shell. Some head shells are pretty thick, and you need a longer screw. These ones are relatively thin, so we're going to use the smaller screws for this one. To mount them on there, hold on, to step away for a second. You place the washer on the screw around the camera. <laughs> and then I have uh, I have a, an actual bin that I keep all the spare screws and hardware and head shells and I have all kinds of parts. You want to save those for later. You may want to try a different head shell or you may have a different turntable you want to move this to. And really, first of all, all you want to do is get just get the screws in and just get it mounted. We're going to adjust this eventually. And uh, when you look, if you look here, you'll notice that these these holes are slotted, so you can you can move this forward and backward quite a bit. There's a reason for that, and we're going to get into that as soon as we get this mounted up. So I just mounted this in here and just barely snug these down so it's just so it'll keep it from sliding. And we're going to go and we're going to connect our wires now. And you should be able to see on here that they're color coded, and I don't know if I can get the lighting in here enough to see it, but you can see how they have left and right, and they have the plus and the minus. I don't know if you could see that in there. I don't know if the lighting is good enough. But the top ones are the positive, the bottom ones are the negative. This is the left, and this is the right, and these are color coded. And if you look onto a head shell, there's actually a color code marking. And yes, these wires are color coded. So if you look, white is the left plus, red is the right plus, green is the right minus, and blue is the left minus. So what we want to do is we want to take the white lead, which is going to be left plus, Let's see if I can do this on camera. And you want it to go to the left plus, which is this front corner one here. And we're going to, and you can use a little pair of pliers if you need, which I probably will. And you want to grab it behind the actual thing there. Let's see if I can do this on camera. And then you just kind of gently wiggle it on there. And you don't want to put a lot of force on it because these pins in here are not super sturdy. You don't want to damage it, especially on the cheap cartridges. These ones are a little more sturdy, but the, the low-end cartridges are pretty bad. And they will break those pins right off. They'll loosen them, and then the cartridge will be ruined. And that's all there is for that. Then we're going to go ahead and put the other the other three on there in the same method. And as soon as I do, I'll be back. And when it's done, it should look something like this. So you can see it's all connected. And you just kind of want to have the wires do a little curl. They just sweep around and go in. Just make it look neat if you can. Okay, I have the stylus and I have the protector back on. I'm just going to put this on to the arm and I'm going to put on my microphone because you probably didn't hear me. 
So what I'm going to do is we're going to attach, we have the cap back on the stylus, so the protectors on there, and we mounted up the head shell. Now there's some information and some words that we're going to need to learn. The first thing we need to know when we're mounting this is a thing called overhang. Every turntable has a specified overhang. And if you look on this one, in the specifications for the turntable, this is right out of the service manual, the overhang is 15 millimeters. And the effective length of the arm is 230 millimeters. So what we're talking about with 15 millimeters is that we want this tip of this stylus right here, the, the actual needle itself, the, the very tip of it, to be about 15 millimeters beyond, kind of like that, hanging over the spindle. So when you bring this across here, and I'm going to unplug it because it's going to want to take off. When you bring this way over here, you can just see, I don't know if you could see at the angle that I'm at. Let me bring this up for a second. Let's go straight down. The tip of the stylus is right around here where my tip of my screwdriver is. And if we go straight back, what we want is the tip of that stylus needs to be about 15 millimeters past here. Now, in the setup guide, they will show you the actual length that you can adjust it using this shoulder right here of the socket as a reference point. So they'll have you take a dial caliper or, or have a um, set of calipers and they'll have you measure from here to the tip of the stylus and they'll tell you that that needs to be a certain length in millimeters. And you're going to adjust these two screws until you have that proper length. Now when they talk about effective length, they're saying that's 230 millimeters. And what that means is if you measure from the center of the pivot point, and we'll find out why this is important in just a moment, but right now we're just going to set the scenario. If you measure from this pivot point right here, the center of it, right? The dead center. And if you go from, they're saying on this that it's supposed to be 230 millimeters. See that? So if we go 230 millimeters, see where that is? That 230 millimeters is exactly the same as that 15. So it's the length from the center point of the arm, the center of the pivot point of the arm, to the spindle, the center of the spindle, plus the overhang. So that's your effective length, 230 millimeters. So what we're going to try to do at the end of the day is we're going to set this for that 15 millimeters of overhang, which will make the center of this the, the tip of this stylus effectively be 230 millimeters from right here in this center point. That's the name of the game right now. So that's what we're going to try to do. Let's, I'm going to have to go get another page out of the service manual so that we are over the owner's manual so that we can see where to adjust that on the head shell. This page is right out of the owner's manual. And if you look, this is what I'm talking about. So they have this little shoulder right here on the plug. And if you measure from the shoulder to the tip of the stylus, we should have 52 millimeters. If we have 52 millimeters from here to here, that will give us our exact 15 millimeters of overhang and our effective arm length of 230 millimeters. So that's what we're going to do. Now you always lock this down. We're going to remove this. And we're going to loosen these screws just enough 
that we can have a little bit of friction but still be able to slide this. So you want to be able to slide it forward and backwards just a little bit like I'm doing now. See that? I'm going to kind of guesstimate and I'm never going to take this cover off until I'm ready to make the actual adjustment or measurement, I'm sorry. <coughs> I'm going to use these little calipers and what we're going to do is we're going to adjust so that it's from here to here and we want it to be 52 millimeters so I'm going to set this to 52 and get as close to 52 on the money as we can there we go. That little tiny bit's not going to make a difference. Then we're going to take the cover off and I'm going to make that measurement right now. And of course the higher end you can see we got it pretty close, so I'm just going to move it out just a tiny little bit. See, I went too far, so now I got to bring it back just a little bit. Not quite. I'm almost there. I think I went a little too far. Nope, right there. All right, that's it. So now that we have that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this little scribe and I'm going to scribe a little line right on there just as soon as I tighten this down. So we're going to just do just a little bit, not super tight. And I'm going to put a little scribe line here, like that. I'm going to put a little scribe line here. And what that's going to allow us to do is when we go to adjust uh, the yaw of this a little bit, that will allow us to uh, kind of have a reference point because we know where we need to be. Okay, that looks pretty good. I'm going to put this back on. And that's going to at least get us in the ballpark where we need to be. Now for everything else in this, you want to make sure that your turntable is perfectly level. Now there's a couple ways we can do that. The easiest is if you actually have a turntable bubble level. So you could see that bubble in there moving around. If you place, there's a hole in the bottom here, you place it over the spindle and you can see right there we're dead on, well you're looking at an angle, but if you look straight down this, my bench is dead level and this turntable right now is perfectly level. You want to do this adjustment while it's perfectly level. I forgot to do this clip, so I'll shoot it after the fact here. Um, if you don't have one of these turntable levels, you can use a regular level. And what I like to do is just because these can be warbly, maybe take that off the platter and you go 90 degrees to one another. So you look this way and it should be relatively level. And then you turn the turntable this way and it should be level this way and it is and you can go back and forth and if once it's level in both planes you know that the turntable is level so that's a way to do it if you don't have one of these levels for the turntable specifically or all the adjustments from now on now let's uh, get ready to do our angle first. 
do yourself a favor before you start this and tape the platter so that it can't rotate or this thing will be taken off on you while you're trying to adjust it. I like to use this blue painters tape because it won't leave any residue and won't leave any gunk on there when you peel it off. It peels right off. So, all right. Now this is not necessary typically when you do, well, part of it's necessary but not all of it. You're going to find that there are several different different alignment points that you can use or alignment methods and they have different names like the Stevenson and I forget the other uh, begins with an L. It's escaping me. Senior moment. But anyway it has to do with the geometry of how the, how the stylus tracks on the record. If you, if you picture what's happening here, this center point, if you take this arm, this is drawing an arc across here. You see that? In other words, it's not going in a straight line like this, it, or it would be a linear tracking turntable, right? It's actually going kind of like this. So, depending on the length, the effective length of the arm, meaning the length from here to the end of the stylus tip and the position of this versus the spindle of the turntable, it's of the platter itself, there will be only two points where the stylus will be parallel. In other words, there will be two points where this will touch on a same tangent line like this and what points you set, the, that's what that name is, that Stevenson versus, uh, begins with an L. <laughs> there, there's several different methods that people use and it affects the way that the needle tracks or the stylus tracks in the record and it can affect the sound and different cartridges and stylus work better with or worse with others. But I believe the Stevenson one is the most common, which I think this is what this one is using. And you can, if you don't know the, this, this information here, what it's telling you, and this information here, what it's telling you, if you say you don't know that about a turntable, you can use this little alignment protractor and you can figure it out yourself. And what you'll find is when you do this, it's going to fall right into what the book told you. What, what the book is not going to do right here is it's not going to make sure that the, the stylus is tracking parallel to the, to the groove in this direction. So that's what these little grid lines are here. What we're going to do is we're going to drop this stylus onto this little dot, little circle, bring it in just a little bit. You can see it's sitting there. And this thing's mirrorized. It, it looks like a mirror. And what we want to do is we want to look straight down like this. And let me see if I can get the camera lined up. All right. Hopefully you're not getting too much reflection. It can distort what you're looking at if you see too much reflection there. There we go. See that? And the idea is the front line of the cartridge, that thrust line, that front line, has to be totally straight with these lines. It has to be parallel to these lines here. If not, we're going to have to loosen these screws and ever so slightly go this way. I think I got it pretty close by eye. And when I look at it, from this angle, it looks almost perfect and you kind of have to look around from a couple different angles to make sure but yeah I think I got it really close. Now <clears throat> it might need a tiny little bit this way but barely if, if at all. And that's where those little scribe lines come in handy is when you start messing around with that you can reference it to your little scribe lines. Now if I lift this up if this is set properly to the Stevenson method 
and I come back up here and I drop this back down, it should be parallel once again. It should be exactly in the same spot. And if I look, it is darn close. It is really close. Okay. It's just a tiny bit off. I'm going to have to move it just, like I said, just a little bit. So I'm going to do that off camera and uh, make the adjustment. So all I'm going to do is loosen these screws and just put a tiny little movement to it till we get it just right. And with one little tiny adjustment, it's dead on. So that's all set to go. Well, I'm shooting this video after I started editing this video to upload it because I completely lost the last portion of this entire video. And the, this has happened to me a couple times. The record button on this camera, every now and then when you hit the record button, you push it once to turn it on, you push it once to put it back in, you know, in standby. Every now and then when I push that record button, it double clicks. So when I'm not record, when I don't want to record, it's recording. And then when I push the record button, it shuts off. If I don't notice the little teeny tiny red letters REC in my viewfinder of my camera, I don't realize this is happening. So every time I'm hitting the button, it's doing the opposite of what I want. That happened for the entire portion of this video concerning the tracking force and uh, and anti-skating alignment procedure for this whole thing. So guess what? I have to do it all over again. <laughs> oh well. Stupid is as stupid does. Is that what they say? All right. So we're going to do the tracking force adjustment in two different methods. We're going to kind of put them together. Well, the first method would be for someone who does not have a tracking force gauge. This is a little thing you can buy online. They're very inexpensive. eBay and all the little, all the turntable supply stores, uh, you know, audio stores, <laughs> Amazon, they all have these and they're very, very inexpensive. It's just a little force gauge that measures in grams the tracking force of the stylus. Tracking force is the actual force, the downward force in grams that the tone arm is applying to the stylus. And each cartridge has its own specified tracking force. If you look at this one, for instance, it has a recommended tracking force of 1.8 to 2.2 grams. And it says two grams is standard. So what they're saying there is they want a downward force pressing down on the stylus into the groove of the record of approximately two grams. And you'll find that different cartridge setups have different recommended tracking forces. Some of them are even around one gram or lighter. That's very, very uncommon, but some of the very high one end ones will have that. Some of them, for instance, the very low cost, like the ceramic cartridges or the very low end turntables with the uh, big conical <laughs> stylus and so forth, they can track as high as five to seven grams. So it just depends on the turntable, the cartridge, the stylus, many different factors. But You'll find in general, these types of turntables will usually use a cartridge and tracking force that will be usually between 1.5 and 2.5 grams, depending on the cartridge. This particular one is 2 grams. That's what we're going to set it for. And we're going to use, first of all, the method where you don't have this. And you're going to find out that it, in, in 
decent turntables, it's going to be pretty close. Now I have to stress when you're doing this, it's a little bit fumbly and if you're not careful and you're not watching where this stylus is at all times, it's very easy for you to damage the stylus by hitting it on the, on the turntable platter or hitting it with your hand. So always watch what you're doing when you do this. And you do have to have the cue lever down so that it can float. The first thing you want to do is you want to take this counterweight and it's threaded. You turn it and you want to take all of the weight off of it. So turning it in towards you makes this front end heavier. Turning it away from you makes the front end lighter. So if I take this off right now, you could see it drops right down. There's no weight on that at all. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the anti-skating. I'm going to turn it all the way down to zero. I'm now going to just gently hold this, taking note of where the stylus is. I'm going to start rotating this outward until I feel the weight coming off my fingers here in the front you'll get to know when it's, you'll know it when it starts coming up. You'll start getting into that. It's getting lighter already. Still got to go some more. Almost. See, it's still wanting to float down on me. Go a little bit more and now it's free floating. That's your null point. And if you look at it from this angle, if you get down here and you look straight across, this should be parallel to the plinth. In other words, it should be kind of floating straight out like this. And looking at it, that's right where we are. So that is what's going to be zero grams. So let's gently move this back over and I'm going to lock this in so it doesn't fall on us. And I'm going to focus you up here on the counterweight. Hopefully it'll focus so that we can see. And if you notice, since I already had this <laughs> aligned, I'm pretty darn close. But if you hold this counterweight with your fingers and don't let it move, this scale ring moves. In other words, we're going to use it to set it to zero because this is zero grams right here. See that? Now, we want two grams, correct? So it's relatively simple. All we do is now when we rotate the counterweight, the friction of that will also turn this ring, this the indicator ring with it. So let's move one gram and there's two grams right there. Now, that probably will be relatively close to two grams. These turntables are pretty well calibrated to, to work that way if you don't have the proper test equipment or the proper strain gauge to check it. If you do have a scale, now we can check it out. So let's use that and verify it. By the way, something that I did do wrong in this video, whenever you're going to do the protractor, and I showed you that, you, you would want to do this roughly like this, do this method prior to doing your alignment. That way you're not putting any excessive force or not enough force <laughs> on the stylus when you're putting it down on the protractor. The other thing is, and you can check out, I did a couple turntable videos, so this is a little bit repeat, but you can go online. Uh, I like the website vinylengine.com, the, the word vinylengine.com. They're a website dedicated to turntables, and they have an entire database of protractors that you can download as, I believe, like a PDF file or something, and you can print them. They even have a little program where you can customize your own protractor so that if you want to use the Bearwald or the Lefgren or Stevenson or whatever type of alignment 
uh, procedure you want, you can specify that. You can also specify the turntable, what, what its recommended effective arm length and so forth is, and it will print a custom one specifically for your turntable. And sometimes that might be better than using one of these commercial standard uh, protractors. So it's up to you. Now, two things. Whenever I go to check the, the tracking force with a scale, I will take, once again, I'll tape down the platter so that it can't move. And I use painter's tape that won't leave any residue. I also remove the platter mat because this has a certain thickness to it and I essentially want the stylus to be riding about at the height that it'll be riding at in the real world. If I put the platter mat on, this, on there, this will be sitting on top of it and this is a good deal thicker than an actual record. So what it's going to do, it's going to raise it up. When you raise this up, the tracking force, especially on the lower cost units that have a spring balance instead of a, an actual counterweight balance, the, the downward force increases as you push up higher. So as a result, it's not going to be the correct weight. So you want to get this at the same plane as close as possible to your record. And I know I'm being very specific about this, but I'll show you the, the way <laughs> that you should do it and if you don't want to get this crazy with it you don't have to but if you really want to get into this these kind of little details make a difference alright so we're going to pick this up we're going to turn this on and it should come up at zero hopefully and it does and we're going to unplug the turntable so it doesn't go taking off on us and we're going to set this down right there. And look how close that came just using that, that gauge. 2.07 grams. I would say that's good. <laughs> that 0 .07 grams really doesn't mean anything. That's pretty close. Let's do an experiment though. I'm going to pick this up. I just want to see something. Some of these counterweight ones aren't as big of a deal, but we're going to put the platter mat on and we're going to do the same measurement with this sitting up on top of the platter mat. Let's see what difference it makes. See what it does? What happened? It's now 2.18 grams, almost 2.2 grams. So that is quite a bit more and that's what I'm trying to talk about when you or what I'm trying to explain when I say that the platter mat does make a difference. So keep that in mind and make sure that uh, this contact point is roughly where the record's going to be. Now that's another reason why you don't want to use one of those little scales that you like a jeweler's scale. Those little ones, they're real thick. They're about the thickness of this and the platter is way up because what's going to happen is even without the platter mat, look how high up they're going to be sitting. And you're going to be putting your stylus way up here. So that's going to really throw off your measurement. So the height of the measuring gauge does make a difference. Now the last thing we want to adjust is our anti-skating. And these numbers represent the amount of tracking force that you're setting for the cartridge. So we have it set for two grams, so we would dial this till it says two. And that's usually going to be very close to where it needs to be. Sometimes you might have to go a little more or a little less, but it'll be very, very close. And again, this is adjusted. Once you get past this, it's another fine adjustment that you have to do by ear. What is anti-skating? 
So when a, a record rotates, that force that the record produces, even if you had a flat record, a flat piece of acrylic with absolutely no groove on it, what's going to happen is when you drop the stylus down onto that flat surface, that rotation force is going to want to cause this arm to pull inwards. And even with the record in the groove, <clears throat> the record groove is shaped like this. Your stylus sits in that groove. The, all of the little bumps and valleys and so forth are carved into the sides of that groove for right and left channel. And your stylus is going back and forth like this. If, you, if your anti-tracking is not set properly, what's going to happen is it's going to want to pull the needle or pull the stylus against one side or the other of the groove, which is going to cause distortion in your sound. In a perfect world, if you had a completely flat platter made of glass, let's say you have a glass plate that's shaped like a record, and you set the, the stylus down on there and turn the turntable on, what should happen is that stylus should just stay in one place. It shouldn't drift forward or backwards. When you see that, that means that the, the anti-skate is set properly. Now, even with that, you still can have a little bit of distortion because the record is slightly different than that flat surface. So again, a lot of audiophiles, we'll use that word, <laughs> people who are critical listeners to vinyl will fine tune that adjustment by ear. A lot of the setup of a turntable is by ear. The more carefully you set it up, the more amazing the sound will be. And I think part of the reason that people don't understand why certain people love the sound of vinyl is that they've probably never heard a turntable that has been properly set up. It really there is a big difference and it is important that you set the turntable properly. Even a cheap turntable when properly aligned will surprise you at how well it performs and how good it sounds. Alright, so I'll tack on two more little notes to this since I have the camera back on. And those are two other alignments, okay? Well, there's three alignments. There's VTA, which is vertical tracking angle. There is azimuth, which is how the cartridge is rotated in the arm like this. So your, your actual stylus, how it's presented to the record this way. And zenith, which is how the needle or how the stylus is tracking in the groove this way. All three of those affect the sound. All three of those have to be pretty much set by ear because it's very hard to see the actual stylus in the groove without a microscope and special equipment and it's much better to fine tune it by ear how you like it to sound. Now we did a slight amount of adjustment of the zenith axis in this video and we used the protractor to make it perfectly parallel. Although in some instances, the way that particular stylus is mounted to the arm, it could be slightly off. So you may have to put a little tiny angle to that to get it to be perfect. And that can only be heard by ear. Remember, if you have anything except for a conical point diamond or conical tip on the, on the stylus, it's going to have kind of a flat axis to it. So like an elliptical, like this one, that, that stylus is kind of shaped like an oval. So it definitely has a front and back to it. And the, when you get into the Shibata type diamond cuts or the, uh, the, the micro line tracking cuts, they get even more <laughs> critical of that angle and you really have to spend time setting them up. The elliptical is pretty forgiving. The conical is extraordinarily forgiving for those. But they still benefit from setting them properly, especially the other thing is the, is the 
azimuth, which you really don't have a lot of adjustment in this. Uh, some of them allow you to adjust it a little bit down here. This one I do not believe does. And you can loosen this ring and have just the tiniest little bit of adjustment there. You can see when you tighten it down. But again, that all has to be done by ear. So I just wanted to put that out there. That would be another video to get into those critical alignments. And also the vertical, the VTA or vertical tracking alignment. That has to do with the, the rake angle or the angle at which the stylus tracks in the groove. So the stylus should not be tracking straight up and down, it, but rather it should have a little bit forward rake angle like that. So it should track ever so slightly like that in the groove. And I forget what the angle is, it's only like two degrees or so off center. But by adjusting that, some turntables, not this one, but for instance my Pioneer uh, PLX 1000, it actually has an adjustment ring here that you can rotate and you can move the arm up and down which will change that rake angle very accurately and you actually find a record that you your ear is very accustomed to and you can adjust it and you can actually hear the sound change. You'll just hear it open up as you adjust that. So that's just another thing. This particular turntable doesn't have that. It's preset at the factory and it, sh it should be at its optimal uh, height from the factory. I have one of my really badly worn records <laughs> that I put on here and you can hear it. I'll just play it a second because everything's copyright strike. That's uh, Dave Brubeck, take five. And uh, you can see that we had to connect it to our preamp. And what this preamp does, once again, is it takes that, remember how, how it only puts out four millivolts of signal? And remember, a line level input is closer to one volt or 500 millivolts, you know, way up there. So what this does is this boost that signal from that low 4 millivolt level up to a more respectable 500 millivolt or 1 volt level and it also puts de-emphasis on the sound before it, in other words, it removes that RIAA curve, that pre-emphasis that's cut into the record. Remember the record has the lower frequencies, the bass frequencies, reduced and it has the high frequencies boosted a little bit. And so what we're going to do is this is going to restore it back to a flat frequency response. So it actually does two things. Then once it comes out of there, it feeds into the line level input of the, our little bench amplifier and goes into our little speakers. So I don't have the big clip speakers, I just have my little homemade speakers connected, but as you can tell, it sounds pretty good. I mean, as good as it can sound through these, <laughs> this little lapel microphone. But anyway, it's tracking very well, it sounds good, everything's working, and this turntable is ready to go onto a system and be enjoyed. Well, that wraps this one up. And I can tell you, I really enjoy listening to vinyl. I know there's always been a debate over, you know, vinyl versus CDs versus cassette versus MP3 and digital and analog and all that. But honestly, it comes down to personal preference. It comes down to the gear that you're using. Uh, people still spend a lot of money on vinyl setups, you know, turntables and so forth, there must be a reason for it. And uh, if you've ever heard a well-adjusted turntable on a good quality record, it is a good sound. I really enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a hobby that I enjoy. I certainly don't get into it like, like other people. There's those who really get, get into the science of it. And yes, this is quite a science. There's a lot to know about it. 
Uh, the couple of buzzwords that I used in this was just an introduction to all of you. But this video was really meant for people who are interested, especially the younger generation that's really, I, I can't believe how many of my, my kids' friends, you know, they're all in their teens and, and lower 20s, mid 20s. They, how much there of a resurgence there is, and an intra, new renewed interest there is for vinyl and for record players and turntables and all this. So uh, I'm glad to see it because it is a really cool thing. There's just something about it. And uh, personally, I really like the sound of it. And again, it's a science. It really is. And I think, again, with the we got into it a little bit here. There's so much more to learn about it that's fascinating, to me at least. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, other than that, we're going to wrap this up. As always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And hey, get out there and grab a turntable and have some fun. Hey, we'll see you again real soon. Take care. Bye-bye.